This is a podcast as part of the University of Kentucky College of Medicine Department of Anesthesiology Keyword Review Didactic Curriculum. The topics are orthopedics and anesthesia and fluids and anesthesia. Let's look at the keywords related to orthopedics and anesthesia first. These are broken down under the headings of embolism, tourniquet, and some miscellaneous complications. Under embolism, you can see that there are air emboli, fat emboli, and thromboemboli. Under tourniquet, there's issues with inflation and deflation, tourniquet pain, and under some miscellaneous complications of orthopedics and anesthesia include postoperative blindness, usually associated with prone spine surgery, peripheral compartment syndrome, and some issues with rheumatoid arthritis and the airway. Regional topics will be covered by Dr. Farrell in another keyword review. Let's start right in on air embolism. Anytime that there's a vein open above the level of the heart, air can be entrained and uh, go to the heart. Shoulder surgery, beach chair position, prone spine surgery with a vein open in the back above the level of the heart, cervical spine surgery in a patient in the sitting position, even hip surgery in a lateral position can put that vein open above the level of the heart. When bubbles come in, those bubbles can go into the right ventricle out into the pulmonary artery and occlude the pulmonary vasculature. If blood flow is decreased to an alveolar unit and there's continued ventilation of that unit, that's dead space, and so you can see a sudden decrease in end tidal carbon dioxide. For example, you're going along at an end tidal CO2 of 40 and suddenly it's 20 you should think about some form of embolization. As those bubbles come in and block the pulmonary vasculature, the pulmonary artery pressure can go up. There can be an airlock from blood trying to get from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, reducing forward flow, cardiac output can drop dramatically, and blood pressure. If an air embolism is uh, suspected, you should inform the surgeon because they can flood the surgical field with saline, uh, that will decrease air being entrained. You will supp supply cardiovascular support, epinephrine for example. Lower the site of that open vein if possible to get it below the level of the heart. The top right is a graphic uh, showing monitoring techniques and how much air volume is required for those monitoring techniques to pick up that there was an air embolism. You can see that TEE is very sensitive right up there at the top with uh, Doppler changes in pulmonary artery pressure and end tidal CO2 or in the middle part of it and to get changes in cardiac output and blood pressure electrocardiographic changes or that classic mill wheel murmur that can be heard sometimes in massive air embolism there's got to be a lot of air entrained. Let's go to the next topic which is fat embolism syndrome. If a patient has a long bone fracture uh, sometimes they can get fat embolism syndrome and it presents often 12 to 48 hours after, say for example, traumatic femur fracture or possibly reaming of a femur during hip surgery. There's some major and minor criteria for diagnosing fat embolism syndrome. And the major criteria include axillary petechiae as shown in the graphic on the far right. You can see those capillaries that are uh, there's petechiae there in the chest wall and the axilla. Fat globules blocking those capillaries. The patient can oft often be hypoxemic and have CNS depression. Some minor criteria include tachycardia and fever. If you look in the back of their eye, sometimes you can see fat emboli, or in their urine, find fat globules, and thrombocytopenia may be associated. Stabilize those fractures early so they stop releasing the fat emboli. Respiratory support uh, should be provided. Steroids are controversial, and heparin and dextran are uh, not effective and were used in the past. Let's go on to the next topic, which is venous thromboembolism. It's a major cause of death after total joint replacement or trauma to the lower extremities. Orthopedic surgeons are very adamant about prophylaxis against uh, thromboembolism in the perioperative period. Why? Because without prophylaxis, more than half can end up with a venous thrombosis, and in some studies, up to a quarter with clinical or laboratory D-dimer, for example, diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And it's fatal uh, in a substantial number of patients when it does occur, and it's highest in surgery for hip fracture. So if you have a patient with total joint replacement or hip fracture, unless there's some major con uh, contraindication, uh, 
uh, prophylaxis with anticoagulants is indicated. Signs and symptoms of venous thromboembolism, if the patient's awake, they can be dyspneic and breathing fast and have that classic pleuritic chest pain and a drop in SpO2. But if it's in the operating room in a patient under general anesthesia, sudden decrease in blood pressure, sudden drop in your SpO2 and bronchospasm, one of the very classic ones is a decrease in end tidal CO2, again, because of dead space, that thromboembolism blocking the alveolar capillary unit's blood flow to it with continued ventilation to the unit. And, for example, your arterial CO2 might go up to 50 while your end tidal CO2 is down at 20, a very large gradient. The right ventricular pressures can go up if the blood flow from the right ventricle is being blocked out into the pulmonary artery by that thromboembolism. CVP can go up, tricuspid regurgitation can go up, and RV can fail. Echo diagnosis uh, is shown on the far right graphic what it would look like, a dilated right ventricle, an empty left ventricle, increased tricuspid regurgitation, other ways to make the diagnosis, uh, arterial blood gas showing the hypoxemia, D-dimer showing the uh, evidence of fibrinolysis, and CT and angio. Let's talk about tourniquet uh, issues next. Tourniquets are applied to extremities to stop blood flow to make surgery uh, easier in that bloodless field. And up at the top right is shown a uh, ankle tourniquet with a white foot with no blood flow. When a tourniquet is put on the thigh, it's usually increased in pressure up to about 100 millimeters of mercury above systolic blood pressure, and on the arm, about 50 millimeters of mercury above systolic blood pressure, although there's variations that uh, different orthopedists use. It obviously, the pressure in the tourniquet must exceed the systolic blood pressure or blood flow will occur to that limb. If the tourniquet is blown up for an extended period of time, for example, we classically think of greater than two hours as being prolonged, you can have neurologic or muscle injury occur. Now there are some absolute contraindications to applying a tourniquet to a limb. One of those is sickle cell disease. If a patient has sickle cell disease and you put a tourniquet limb on and the tissue gets ischemic and the red blood cells that are present in that ischemic tissue don't have uh, oxygen, the hemoglobin sickles, and a sickle crisis can occur. If a patient already has severe peripheral vascular disease, uh, obviously a tourniquet could make that significantly worse ongoing ischemia in the operative limb, and then there's some relative contraindications, including peripheral neuropathies that are pre-existing, a dialysis graft in that limb, and a proven infection in the operative limb. Tourniquet pain is another issue that can occur. In fact, uh, up to two-thirds of patients during limb surgery under regional anesthesia will have uh, tourniquet pain. It often occurs about 30 to 60 minutes after the tourniquet's inflated. There's a gradual increase in the patient's blood pressure, a dull, burning, deep, poorly localized pain that's carried through the C fibers occurs. The patient is not very happy, and the management is often to deepen the anesthesia, provide increased IV analgesia or sedation in that awake patient under regional anesthesia, occasionally have to convert to a general ketamine in small doses, and a double cuff use where one uh, cuff can be deflated and the other one remain up uh, can help in some cases. Intercostal brachial musculocutaneous nerve block can be used uh, for arm cuff to attempt to reduce uh, tourniquet pain. And the definitive treatment, obviously, is take the cuff down. Issues with inflation and deflation of a tourniquet. When you inflate a tourniquet, the systemic vascular resistance goes up. And as the volume and systemic vascular resistance goes up, your blood pressure and CVP will go up during inflation that limb will continue to metabolize anaerobically and produce acid, and the temperature will go down in that limb, so that when you deflate the tourniquet, all of those anaerobic metabolites are gonna go into the central circulation, things like acid, CO2, um, and the blood that is in that limb will be cooler and will decrease core body temperature. So as deflation of a tourniquet suddenly will decrease volume and systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure and CVP often go down. You can see a decrease in the core body temperature, acute rise in end tidal CO2 often 
you'll be going along merrily with this entitled CO2 of 35 and it jumps up to 50 or more. And you can imagine that even a transient increase in end tidal CO2 could raise cerebral blood flow and if it was in a patient with a traumatic brain injury or high CP issues it could raise intracranial pressure. And the potassium that's released in that tissue uh, also is when a tourniquet goes down is released into the central circulation and can cause problems. So drop in blood pressure, rise in end tidal CO2, drop in body temperature, increase in body potassium and acidosis. Peripheral compartment syndrome, next topic. Acute compartment syndrome can occur when, for example, muscle becomes edematous when it's injured or there's a fracture present and the fascial structure planes are present. So the muscle swells up with fluid, it's inside the fascial structure, it can't go anywhere so the pressure builds up inside. In the leg, the anterior part of it is one of the most common places for this to occur. Pain out of proportion to the apparent injury is one of the presenting symptoms with the classic five P's being still having a palpable pulse. If they have lost their pulses, this is a really late finding. It should have been picked up earlier. Palpable pulse, pallor, paralysis, paresthesia, and a lot of pain. And when you stick a needle into the compartment, which is shown in the right upper graphic, uh, measuring the uh, compartment pressures, if they're high, and there's different values that people use for forming uh, for indicating the need for a fasciotomy, somewhere around about 30 millimeters of mercury is where some will use to say, aha, I need to go in, open up that fascial plane, allow the muscle to expand uh, and so that it doesn't die in there and the nerve uh, be uh, injured also. Now the next topic is methyl methacrylate or bone cement. And bone cements are used often during uh, hip surgery, for example. And this bone cementing process is associated with high intramedullary pressures as they hammer inside uh, the bone. And as the bone pressure inside increases during the hammering, some of that cement can go into the central circulation along with fat and air and bone marrow. So emboli can occur, but also that methyl methacrylate undergoes an exothermic reaction when it's mixed up. It's hot. And as it's hammered in, Profound hypotension and circulatory collapse occasionally occur during the cementing process with the etiology not completely understood of why it occurs. But one explanation is absorption of the volatile monomer of the methyl methacrylate itself, so it causing vasodilation. Another explanation is embolization of substances inside there like the uh, cement, fat, air, or bone marrow that can occur during femoral reaming and even lysis of red blood cells or marrow because of the hot reaction that's occurring with that uh, uh, bone cement. Make sure the patient's hydrated and inspired oxygen's up during the period of uh, bone cementing to minimize hypotension and hypoxemia that can accompany the cementing of the prosthesis. And it's probably wise to turn off nitrous oxide during cementing uh, because there is a definite risk of air emboli and nitrous would expand an air emboli that is a um, uh, that air emboli bubble would get bigger if nitrous was being administered during the time that it occurred. Perioperative blindness, ischemic optic neuropathy, is something that is associated with prone spine procedures. Patients who have uh, big back procedures of long duration where they've lost lots of blood, especially in male patients who are obese, that's the classic presentation of ischemic optic neuropathy, which can present as unilateral or bilateral blindness in the postoperative period, painless, and it's often of the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy variant. Um, and the graphic on the far right is an attempt to show what an optic disc would look like in a patient with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, optic disc edema being present. While posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, less common than AION, the optic disc may appear normal because the ischemic optic nerve is uh, posterior to this, uh, this uh, optic disc. Risk, as previously mentioned, prone spine procedures were long duration with lots of blood loss in males who are obese. Some recommendations from the American Society of Anesthesia are that we mix colloids with our crystalloids to maintain intravascular volume that there is really no specific transfusion threshold where we should give blood, let's say they're hemoglobin seven or eight, we're starting to worry about 
Is there going to be enough oxygen delivered to that um, optic nerve? There is no defined specific transfusion threshold where, that says we should give blood at some specific level. Check the head position. Avoid the head down below the heart and try to keep it the head in a neutral position. Next topic is rheumatoid arthritis and atlantoaxial subluxation, something that we're worried about in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well as Down syndrome. But anterior subluxation is quite common in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and <clears throat> there's a risk of cord injury during laryngoscopy. If we move the neck in an either flexion or extension, obviously that subluxation can worsen and it appears that flexion is worse in most cases. Rheumatoid arthritis can also compromise the airway by reducing cervical spine mobility, mobility of the temporal mandibular joints, the cricoratinoid joints, and you can see why uh, you should spend considerable time evaluating the airway of a rheumatoid arthritic patient to make sure that maybe you need to do an awake fiber optic innovation or have a glide scope available or a fiber optic scope available in the room. Our next group of uh, topics is fluids in anesthesia, and I've broken these down into major categories of physiology and fluid types, colloids versus crystalloids, some complications of fluids, and then some clinical applications, and uh, we'll go through those now. First, fluid physiology and the importance of the glycocalyx. At the far right is a graphic showing an endothelial cell with the glycocalyx on top of it and the vascular lumen then uh, above it. This glycocalyx is, think of it as a protective layer between the vascular lumen and the endothelial cell. We want it intact and healthy. Crystalloids tend to pass through it quite freely while colloids are held back if it's healthy. Um, and by limiting the amount of surgical trauma and avoiding intravascular hypervolemia is something that can be done to keep the glycocalyx healthy. Starling's law of capillaries helps us think about where fluids go based upon several competing things. One, the hydrostatic pressure which drives fluids out of capillaries into the tissue. Two, the oncotic osmotic pressure which draws fluid into the uh, uh, intravascular space from the tissues. And then there's something that we ought to think about called the filtration coefficient, which really defines the leakiness of the vessel walls, which is also a factor in the balance of fluid. So hydrostatic pressure drawing it out of the uh, uh, vasculature, osmotic pressure drawing it back in. And in the case of sepsis, for example, we can have leaky vessel walls that allow fluids through those vessel walls easier. Body water and osmolality. How much of a normal adult is body water? Well, about 60%, so 60% of a 70 kilogram person is about 42 liters of water. The graphic on the far right shows body water going into both the extracellular, about a third, uh, while intracellular is two thirds. So most of the body water is in the intracellular space. If we take that extracellular space, uh, interstitial and plasma, you can see that the plasma space is only about 8% of where body water goes. An example of this would be if I gave D5W a liter to a patient, the dextrose would be metabolized by the patient leaving water and the water would go into the body space, two-thirds intracellular, one-third extracellular, and less than 10% or so into the intervascular space. Therefore, D5W is not a good intervascular volume expander because a liter, only about 100 mils or less, would stay in the intervascular space. Our body water decreases as we age, the percent body water, if we're obese and in females. The graphic on the bottom right shows a baby at birth being about 80% body water, normal adult 60 to 70%, and an elderly person uh, about 50%. Osmolality normally is about 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram, and the uh, graphical representation of how to calculate osmolality is using sodium, glucose, and BUN, and you can see that sodium by far makes the biggest component to normal osmolality. If sodium was 140, two times sodium of 140 would be 280, uh, while glucose, let's say it's 100 divided by approximately 18 would be about five or so, very small component of, of osmolality contributed by glucose and BUN under normal conditions. IV fluids, D5W, is hypoosmolar, 
uh, 0.9 normal saline is hyperosmolar, lactated ringers is isoosmolar, and if you happen to be using hypertonic saline, for example, in a patient with traumatic brain injury and high intracranial pressure, it is very hyperosmolar, approximately 900 milliosmoles per liter. If we look at fluid types now, normal saline first, you can see that normal saline has 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium and 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride. That is a lot of chloride. And the osmolarity is about 308. Ringer's lactate has a sodium of 130, some potassium in it. Uh, along with uh, chloride, one of the anions is lactate, which is metabolized by your liver to bicarbonate, and an osmolarity of about 274. Not mentioned here is the fact that Ringer's lactate also has some calcium in it. Plasmolite, very close to what's in our body. Sodium 140, potassium of about 5, chloride 98, acetate uh, is used as an anion, and the osmolarity is about 295. D5W, very hypoosmolar, 252. Albumin, 5%, uh, sometimes we use that for volume expansion as a colloid. Has some sodium in it, about 145 milliequivalents per liter, and is hyperosmolar, 330 milliosmoles per liter. Had to start 6%. Has sodium chloride in it, 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride, and is also hyperosmolar. So let's compare crystalloids versus colloids. If you have a healthy glycocalyx, that layer uh, above your endothelial cell that's protective, it's going to limit colloids to stay in the intravascular space. If you give either colloids or crystalloids, intravascular expansion can occur and hemodilution uh, of the uh, hemoglobin that's present. Colloids, 5% albumin in a HESPAN, one to one. If I give it 100 mils of 5% albumin, 100 mils of intravascular volume expansion occurs. However, if I give lactated ringers or saline, there's that three to one rule that says that if I give about 100 mils of lactated ringers, only about a third of it provides intravascular volume expansion. Albumin is very important for maintaining oncotic pressure. Sodium is very important for maintaining osmotic pressure. And both crystalloids and colloids can cause a dilutional coagulopathy. That is, if you give large volumes of them, they can dilute out the platelets, dilute out the coagulation factors, and you can get into a coagulopathy simply from a dilutional effect. There's little difference in efficacy between crystalloids and colloids, and these have been debated. Which one should I give and how much under what conditions? Head of starch has some uh, coagulation and renal issues. Uh, if head of starch is given in relatively large volumes, factor 8C and von Willebrand's factor um, uh, can be diluted out. A dilutional coagulopathy can occur. The recommendation is that we should not exceed 20 mils per kilogram. That means a 70 kilogram patient, about a liter and a half in a 24 hour period, would be on the high end. And head of starch is avoided in patients with renal insufficiency and in the critically ill because there's newer evidence that suggests head of starch can cause a renal injury and it's not used in the cardiopulmonary bypass prime anymore. Some complications of crystalloids are listed here next. We'll start with saline. 0.9 normal saline has um, a chloride of 154 milliequivalents per liter. It's very hyperchloremic. Lots of that chloride anion hanging around. Strong ion difference, by definition, is cations minus anions. So if I give a lot of chloride to a patient, that's an anion. So cations minus anions becomes a narrower or decrease in the strong ion difference. Well, if you gave a lot of chloride, an anion, you've got to maintain electrical neutrality. So water dissociates to a hydrogen ion, positively charged, to maintain that electrical neutrality. So what do you end up with? Lots of chloride, hyperchloremic, acidosis because of the hydrogen ion that dissociates from water to maintain that electrical neutrality. Large volume resuscitation with normal saline can result in that classic hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Lactated ringers, lactate is one of the anions that can be metabolized to bicarbonate by our livers and cause a metabolic alkalosis. Acetate and citrate are also metabolized to bicarbonate. Um, calcium is also present in lactated ringers and can precipitate 
uh, citrated blood if it, it is infused in the same line. So we often don't use lactated ringers to dilute out our packed red blood cells that are citrated, for example. The sodium in lactated ringers is only about 130 and can result in hyponatremia. And there's some potassium in lactated ringers, so if you're giving it to a patient who has complete renal failure, uh, that potassium could build up, and we often avoid lactated ringers in patients with renal failure. D5W, very hypoosmolar, and the water can increase uh, brain edema and traumatic brain injury patients. Glucose is bad for an ischemic or injured brain. Uh, if you have an ischemic brain and with a high glucose load around, that glucose can be anaerobically metabolized to more acid, uh, worsening brain injury. So providing a dextrose-containing solution who has a traumatic brain injury or stroke, probably not a great idea unless they're hypoglycemic. In patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis, a disease in which um, under conditions of low potassium, they can get skeletal muscle paralysis. They still breathe, but they have skeletal muscle paralysis. Um, glucose load can do this. Why? Because if you give them a large glucose load, for example, dextrose, the body's glucose goes up, insulin is released, insulin drives the glucose into the cell, insulin also drives the potassium into the cell. As the potassium goes down, the patient is hypokalemic and can precipitate hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Last couple slides on clinical applications in fluids. Assessing volume status, classically we've used urine output and blood pressure and cardiac output. Maybe get fancy and put an echo down and look at end diastolic volume or a PA catheter and look at wedge pressure, CVP, heart rate, all things in an attempt to determine do I need to give more volume or not. Fluid responsiveness is a, a newer thing that we use and that is a dynamic parameter uh, that is used to predict response to fluid loading rather than a static parameter like central venous pressure. One of those dynamic parameters is simply taking a patient's legs and lifting them and looking at some measures such as stroke volume or blood pressure changes with fluid loading from lifting those legs up. And this is uh, just a temporary thing that occurs. You can put the legs back down and get an estimate of what's gonna happen if I give that patient some volume. Another fluid responsiveness measure is pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, which uh, we can look at in patients uh, during mechanical ventilation who are, uh, have neuromuscular blockade present. And these heart-lung interactions can give us an idea about volume status. And up at the top right is shown stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation. You can see that during inspiration, there's an initial increase in volume followed by a decrease. And um, that increased volume and changes in volume that occur with respiration, these heart-lung interactions, the wider they are, the bigger the stroke volume variation with respiration, and the bigger the pulse pressure variation that can occur with respiration suggests that the patient uh, needs fluids. You can also look at the vena cava size and how it changes during uh, a positive pressure ventilation. And in the bottom right shows a hypovolemic patient and that IVC uh, changing in size with ventilation. The Bainbridge reflex or the atrial reflex is what happens when the atria is stretched or filled. So if I pour in a lot of fluid, stretch the left and right atrium, <clears throat> the atrium stretches, the heart rate goes up. I like to think of it as the atria gets big and says, I've got to get back to a normal size. The way to do that is speed up my rate and empty more. And so the Bainbridge reflex is an increase in heart rate in response to filling of the atria. Burns, crystalloids are usually used for resuscitation of burns patients because leakage of colloids can increase edema, especially in the first days after a burn. The Parkland formula is one of the classic formulas for burn resuscitation. Lots of crystalloids, four mils uh, of crystalloid per kilogram per percent burn in the first 24 hours. And then there's the modified Brook formula, which is two mils of lactated ringers per kilo per percent burn first 24 hours. Traumatic brain injured patients, the goal is to obviously maintain their blood pressure and cardiac output to get blood perfusing to their head, but at the same time avoiding edema of the brain and increased intracranial pressure. So one of the goals is to maintain 
osmolality, and sodium is a very large component of that, so isotonic crystalloids are widely used in uh, resuscitation and avoiding hypotonic solutions. We should avoid hyperglycemia because D5W would increase the glucose, cause the hyperglycemia, potentially uh, cause worsening of ischemic or traumatic brain injury, and also potentially decreasing serum osmolarity as the, the water from the D5W would decrease serum osmolarity. Hypertonic saline, or 3% saline, has an osmolality of about 900 milliosmoles, and that along with mannitol is sometimes used to decrease intracranial pressure in patients with traumatic brain injury. This ends our discussion, and as you can see, we covered the orthopedics, uh, keywords of embolization, tourniquet, some of the complications, and we also covered fluids, uh, physiology and fluid types, the colloid versus crystalloid issues, and some complications of fluids, including some clinical applications such as burns and traumatic brain injury. I hope that you learned something that you can apply to your clinical practice today, and I hope you have a wonderful day.